Good afternoon, everyone. I can see people are filing into our Zoom room here. I'm Bex Hayho, the Executive Director of United and Homelessness with Orange County United Way, and we are here today for our June community chat. Our community chats are a series that we produce every month on a variety of subjects all connected to homelessness to help empower us as a community to have a better response to homelessness. And so we try to bring innovative solutions uh, to our community chat series. We bring in local experts here from Orange County or national experts from around the country, uh, which is one of what we're doing here today, um, to try to help provide crucial information uh, for those of us who are working to end and resolve homelessness. So I'm really excited to be having a conversation around how people perceive homelessness, the power of language and how we use language and how we can use language um, in a way that helps get us closer towards our goals of solving homelessness. And so today I am thrilled to be joined by two incredible leaders in this field of work, both of whom I have encountered at the National Alliance to End Homelessness Conferences, at Funders Together to End Homelessness Conferences, and I'm really thrilled to be able to bring their wisdom and their expertise to today's conversation. So I'm thrilled to be joined by Marisol Bayo, who serves as the Executive Director of the Housing Narrative Lab, which is a national research and strategic communications nonprofit who specializes in messaging about homelessness. Also thrilled to have Unai Montez, who's the Narrative and Strategic Communications Director for Housing California, a statewide group that advocate for housing solutions. So thank you to both of you for joining us today. So excited for these conversations and how this lines up with the work of United to End Homelessness and the work we know many other organizations are diligently doing in our community and beyond. So before we dive in and I start going through some really specific questions, I think it's important that we frame what it is that we're going to be talking about today, because not everybody is going to be familiar with terms like narrative and narrative change. So first question, how would you describe those terms for anybody joining us today who's hearing these for the first time or has perhaps heard them but isn't too sure what exactly it is that they mean? And Marisol, I'll come to you first. Super. Thank you so much, Bex. So excited to be here today uh, with you and Unai and everyone. So uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, so I would love to talk a little bit about this. Um, so the first thing I would say about narrative is that narrative is really about how people think and the stories that are shaping how we view the world. It's very different than strategic communications, right? I think that folks maybe conflate the two and they're not the same. Strategic, strategic communications is more geared toward a campaign, an event, something really specific. The narrative change that we work on at the lab and that Unai are, o and I are always wrestling and talking about is really about what are we doing to help shape how people think and understand the issue of housing instability and homelessness. And so just very quickly, we think of narrative as the collection of stories that shape how we view or think about the world. And then the stories are about how we communicate, right, those ideas. And lastly, we think about messages, and the messages are the words we use, the images we use, the sounds we use, that's what then kind of the pieces of the stories. So they're all different. They're not kind of the same. They're not the same thing, but they're also super connected. That's super helpful. Thank you. Unai, what would you add to that? Um, thanks. Thank you. Yes, I echo the thanks to um, to United End Homelessness for hosting us today. Very excited to be here live from my um daughter's bedroom, my seven-year-old daughter's bedroom. So if you see a little girl flying behind me, it's because I'm working from home today, um, which is the best place to work, as we all know. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, again, like some things that are helpful in thinking about narrative versus other pieces of the world of communication matrices or information processing, right? We use a lot of analogies, right, to help people. Um, one analogy that's very popular is like narrative is a mosaic. And we use narrative as a mosaic to think about breaking and building, right? If you're making a mosaic, 
you have things that are going to become the pieces of that mosaic. Sometimes you have to break, you have to shatter, you have to demolish, and then you rebuild out of those pieces of vision. Another way of thinking about narrative is to think about narrative as soil, right? Like, because it's not a static thing, it is a living thing. It is something that you constantly have to tend to, right? Anyone who's ever done any kind of like community garden or tried to like, you know, successfully keep plants alive at home or in the office knows you can't just sort of like set it and forget it, right? Which is what a, a lot of us want to do with our work um, when it comes to communications, but specifically the work around narrative is to think about if I'm tending a community garden, I've got lots of different plants that are in the soil. Some are going to grow quickly. Some are going to grow slowly. Some are going to require a little bit of extra attention. There's always going to be like gophers and caterpillars and all kinds of things coming for your narratives. Um, and again, it is a collective thing. It is, it is not the work of one individual. It is not one product. So each campaign, each story lives within that soil. Um, and that is like a sort of, again, an, a good analogy of like, you know, the the base building around narrative and how we begin to think about narrative. And I will apply early on like the sort of like big sweeping historical uh, reference point for this, which is if I were to ask anyone um, anywhere in the United States about the civil rights movement, if they felt positively or negatively about the civil rights movement, the majority of folks I would wager, regardless of where you are, would say that they feel positively about the civil rights movement, right? And you so you would start to kind of unpack that because it's a very aspirational movement, because it's a very hopeful movement, because it makes you feel like there can be retribution and justice and righting of past wrongs, right? And it can show like the best of who we are and bring out the best of our sort of collective identity um, as residents of the United States of America, right? But if you were to pull apart any of the individual stories from the civil rights movement, those are all painful, right? Like those are all complicated. Those are all difficult, right? You're talking about Martin Luther King's life ends with his assassination, as does Malcolm X's, as does JFK's, as does RFK's, right? You think about the bombing of churches. You think about little girls losing their lives. You think about uh, student uh, massacres. You think about a lot of difficult, painful, horrible, grotesque things. Those are in isolation, right? Those are in isolation. But the way that you process all of these stories, the way that you contextualize these stories, the way that you can take things that are creating cognitive dissonance in your mind and come out feeling hopeful and aspirational, that is a successful narrative. The civil rights movement is the most successful narrative that we can point to because it has a lot of different issues, a lot of different stories that all point us in a hopeful and aspirational direction. Thank you, Renai. So, you know, one of the things that we're sort of chatting about today is narrative change and, and how do we do that when it comes to homelessness? And we know that anytime we're trying to address unconditional biases or prejudices and, and things that, you know, we're maybe not even aware are going on in our subconscious around why we think what we think. You know, anytime we're doing that, there's potential for conflict um, and for challenges along the way. So how do you create space in conversations for people who do approach homelessness differently? And I don't know who wants to tackle this first. <laughs> and I, why don't you jump in first and I'll, we'll take <laughs> turns. I knew you were going to do this to me, Marty. So I just knew it. I could see it. Um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's, you know, again, part of this evolving landscape um, around language, right? And the way that we embrace or run away from certain words or certain frames that we feel are very polemic. And I think from a narrative perspective, it's important to think about, um, you know, not only like the things that have um, generally brought us to the table, right? So conversations around values, we talk about freedom, um, we talk about community, right? Those are things that kind of help shape and bring us to the table. I also think it's important to think about where we want to start that conversation. Like whenever you're talking about something which has historically been um, divisive or feels polarizing or causes people to retreat to sort of like muscle memory around an outlook, you know, you want to start a conversation differently in a different place, right? And so a good, I think, historical example for this um, is if anybody like has, you know, a Back to the Future DeLorean handy or like a hot tub time machine or whatever, your favorite time travel device is, if you want to go back all the way to 2010, in 2010, there was a law in the state of Arizona 
um, which was, you know, called Arizona SB 1070. And it was essentially like a way for the state of Arizona to start asking folks that they suspected were immigrants to prove that they were legal residents of the United States and of the state of Arizona, right? The initial conversation around this piece of legislation was, you know, has the federal government failed to defend our borders? Have we like, you know, become invaded from immigrants and so on and so forth? There was a lot of really different problematic and really contentious frames, right? And the immediate conversation, the reactive, the gut reactive conversation became around like, you know, the worthiness of different individuals. Well, no, like this person is not, you know, um, the way that you've pictured them. They're actually like a very worthy individual with a compelling story. Um, but that also didn't serve the purposes of a narrative shift because it made us um, have debates about the politics of being deserving, right? We were having conversations about who was deserving and who was undeserving. That was not the place where we needed to have a conversation. Um, and I was fortunate enough to be part of a group of folks that wanted to help shift the narrative around that specific instance in time. And so what we did is we put up a crowdsourced billboard in Phoenix, Arizona, um, that said, you know, get your papers out, racial profiling ahead. And we convened a group of journalists uh, to work with us to like introduce this idea of the papers please law, right? We wanted to have a conversation about the, the act, what was happening, which was a racial profiling, you know, you know, basically carte blanche on racial profiling, right? It was the ability to basically look at somebody and based on their skin color, based on their surname, based on things that were very surface, apply a different set of values, a different set of laws and a different set of treatment as official policy. People have a gut reaction, which feels very gross and anathema to that, right? Like they don't want that precisely because they have this idea from the civil rights movement that we shouldn't be treating people differently on the basis of their skin color, right? So if we can start the conversation on what we should be doing and what we shouldn't be doing, and we can agree about what we should be doing in terms of dignity and in terms of like honoring people, then that begins to shift our conversation in a different way. So I think a lot of what we need to do, again, around narrative shift is to think about where do we want to start to have these conversations around our homelessness policies, around our specific treatment of folks who are unhoused, right? And where beginning those conversations can we lead folks that will allow us to arrive at the place where we want to in terms of policy and programmatic outcomes? I love that, Unai. Yeah. Uh, oh, absolutely. I, and I would I would add, I, I wanted to just um, talk a little bit more, explore a little bit more this idea of shared values and how we, especially when we're talking to people who think differently about an issue, in this case, housing insecurity and homelessness, coming at it from this place of shared values. And when we talk about that, we're not saying only focus on the positive, give us the rainbows and the unicorns. We're not talking about that. What we're saying is, what are the things that connect you, that bring us together, right? Um, home, home is a place where we can all be safe. Home also can represent wealth building. Home can represent the place where we are, uh, be ourselves, right? The belonging, the community. What does home mean? to different folks. And that's the entry point where we start the conversation. Think about when you meet someone for the very first time, right? You're looking for what are the points of connection? Where are you from? Where's your family from? Where'd you grow up? Where'd you go to high school, right? All the things that you're looking for when you're first meeting someone, you're not starting in the place where like, it's the worst of the worst. Although maybe that is the place that is the connection point, right? That maybe, we both are coming at this because we've experienced something very similar. So again, it's a shared value is what is the point of connection that we are, that we have and that we're bringing people in with, right? Um, that we're connecting with people with. So I just, one thing I will add to that <clears throat> at the lab, one of the things that we are doing is <clears throat> recognize, we recognize that you're, that different people have different experiences. So the thing that's gonna connect you and I, Bex, may not be the same thing that's gonna connect Unai and us and, and I, right? So different audiences are gonna respond differently based on the values that they hold dear. We do at the lab a lot of research, narrative research, to really look at how we are communicating with different audiences based on the values they hold. So again, it's not about like everybody has to say the same thing. 
This is really about how are we connecting with different groups based on the values that they hold. So important. And I loved what you said about, you know, when we meet somebody for the first time, absolutely, we're trying to find those points of connection. Um, you know, and that's the moment, uh, you know, in that new relationship, we're like, ah, yes, <laughs> you know, and where you dive in and you build that trust and establish that rapport. Um, and so absolutely, that makes perfect sense why it is that we need to be looking for that when we're, you know, as we're getting ready or building, you know, to be leaning into conversations around homelessness. Uh, so thank you for both of you for your insights. Um, we know, you know, homelessness is is such an urgent and pressing issue. Um, and and we know, you know, for anybody who's in the midst of experiencing homelessness or, or people who are perhaps tuned in who are working on the front lines of, of agencies trying to address homelessness. Um, and they may be wondering, you know, this is lovely, you're talking about our use of language, but we're like, in it now. And so again, I just want to come back to that. Like, can you help just talk a little bit more about that relationship between what we say and what we do and just explore this concept a bit more for me? That would be fantastic. And Unai, I'll start with you. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think about, um, you know, we try to begin a conversation the same way that anyone does, um, you know, build those connections, right? On like, you know, what, where do we have this conversation where we have words in common, where we have experiences in common or might be overlapping, right? But we can't sort of remain there, right? We have to be gearing in a direction, right? And so I think like you have these trigger points that become aspirational trigger points, right? So like specifically, I think a lot about, you know, some of the challenges that we're facing now um, around workforce, right? Like, you know, so we we have seen, um, thanks to, in I think large part to folks like Marisol, like more folks with lived experience having center stage in op-eds, in, you know, spaces in which like they're getting better, fuller treatment in interviews where, where there are more complete stories being told, right? Where it's not just a, a person who is currently unhoused and the sole focus of the story is how they are unhoused, and then it immediately jumps from them to a statistic like 171,000 folks in the point in time county having experienced homelessness, right? We are getting a more complete picture of individuals. Like here is someone who was raised in a, in a military family, whose mom is West Indian. Like you're sort of seeing more humanity, more human beings, which create more opportunities for people to see themselves, right? And build bridges um, of commonality. And the other place where we're trying to now build out more of those bridges of commonality around these frontline workers, right? And again, it is it seems, again, from a very practical standpoint, like something that should be a one-to-one -one correlation, having all just gone through this pandemic together, having seen that there were essential workers that were still out there risking everything because their jobs could not be done remotely, right? Or they could not be laid off. Um, and those folks on the front lines assisting folks who are experiencing homelessness, those are like, that's the front line of the front line, right? But we don't know enough about our frontline workforce. We don't know enough about the challenges of being short staffed, about being underpaid, about not having career ladders, right? You know if you're in it, right? You know if you're in it and you do this work, but you don't know if you're outside of it. But fortunately, we do have a lot of language based on movements like the Fight for 15 around workforce, around pay equity, around inequity. And we can start doing what we've done best historically is to think about those bridges of solidarity. A lot of times we wanna have a conversation about homelessness. And so we start the conversation around homelessness. Well, that gives you a limited audience, right? But if you have a bigger conversation about inequity, a bigger conversation about, you know, the sort of greater universal struggle of living in a very expensive state of California and not having enough to cover your basic needs, being burdened and having more than a third of your income going to the cost of keeping you in rental or purchased homes, right? That begins to have more inroads for folks that can then gear them toward we, where we want them to land specifically with this language. Um, and I think that that's, incredibly important um, to think about, you know, not just that people understand the challenges, but that they see that there's something in common, even if they don't fully understand the challenges. My sort of fortune cookie lesson of this is that a lot of people believe if only our, edu you know, if only our leaders were more educated on the realities of what it's like 
to provide homelessness services. Or if only they were more educated on the realities of what it's like to be unhoused, they would do different policy. But I don't think that that's true. I don't think having perfect information gives you perfect policy or perfect programs. I don't think that's the way that people act. I think if people act on the basis of what they feel motivated to invest in and trust in, you make a lot of leaps and of leaps of faith in your life, right? Not only in how you vote, who you choose to marry, where you choose to work, you don't ever have perfect information, right? Only after something happens can you look back and have perfect information. You're making a lot of decisions in your life on a daily basis based on partial information. And I think that's what we need to be thinking about. What is that really strong partial information? How is it interwoven into a, a narrative that allows people to process cognitive dissonance and then take the steps in the right direction to advance the right policies and the right programs? I love that. And the, th the other thing I would lift up or add to that, um, because Unai, uh, Unai, Unai, Unai is so right when you were talking about how people are acting. The thing about narrative that we all need to remember is that people act based on what they think. People act based on what they believe. And so to give a little example or a quick example of that is if you believe that homelessness is the result of someone making a bad choice, when our solution is we should give people free housing, we should give people more vouchers, we should help them pay for their rent. There is a dissonance right there because folks are like, wait, we're going to give them free what? Why are we doing that if they made bad choices? And the work of narrative is to help them see that homelessness or housing instability in our case, is not about bad choices. We're trying to break that narrative and that operates in someone's head and help them see, oh, wait, there are a lot of barriers and systems at play here. Your jobs are not paying you enough. Rents are really high. There's not enough uh, health care and access to mental health services. Uh, you know, structural racism, redlining, people being pushed into certain communities because of the color of their skin. We could go on for a long time here, folks, right? And the work that we are doing, we talk about narrative and narrative leading to how people act. It is because we need to change how they feel about this issue in order then for them to support the proven policies that we're talking about, i.e., you have to help people with rent, you have to help people with more housing. Right. But when they see the systems that kind of push people into this homelessness and housing instability, that's when the policies that we are talking about make sense to them. The reason we get so much pushback now is because they don't know. They don't believe that. They believe that people are making bad choices. So our solutions make zero sense to them. And so the work that we're trying to do is break some of that. So I want to just really put a pin or really reiterate how the narrative work we're doing is about shifting how people act. So we shift their beliefs so we can shift how they act. And that to our end is to build support for the proven solutions. Fantastic, thank you so much. I know uh, I, I was just taking a quick look at who we have who's joined us today. And we have a lot of people that work for nonprofits on the call today, which is fantastic. Um, and we tend to see, you know, in the nonprofit world, our approach to communications tends to be to try to reach as broad of an audience as possible and cast a wide net so we don't miss anybody. But I heard you talking earlier about the importance of knowing who you're talking to um, and some targeted communications to targeted audiences. So could you dig in a little bit more to this? And, and Marisol, I'll come to you first. Absolutely. So much of, thank you, Beck, so much of the research that we are doing is actually looking at audiences and the values they hold. I'll use Orange County as a really good example, right? I mean, Orange County is one county with a lot of different communities. And so how you may talk to Northern Orange County is going to be very different than how you talk to Southern Orange County because people are coming in with different experiences. They were born in different countries. They have different income levels and education levels. So all of that impacts how you talk to people. Now, the shared values may be the same. So let's say, for example, universally, most people believe that housing is a basic need. We get that people should have a safe place to call home. And we get that um, housing is a, is a basic need. 
So how we, the stories that we are telling and shaping about that need and about how if you have housing, you thrive, will be different with an immigrant community than maybe a community that has had a lot more opportunity to succeed. And so that's where different audiences become really important. It's not that your narrative is changing. The narrative is the same, right? We want to help people understand that housing is a basic need that then we need to invest in as a public good. But how I'm going to tell that story is going to be framed differently, is going to be shaped differently. The stories will change. The messaging will change based on the different audiences. And we see that, uh, again, I'll, I'll point to, to a lot of the research. Again, not just research that the lab has done. There's been research both on housing and other um, health care issues, just a variety of issues, really digging into different audiences. And what we see is that um, certainly black and brown communities think very differently than maybe Asian communities, than um, uh, communities with slightly more income and education, right? And so again, it's really important to talk with your audiences. And the last thing I'm actually gonna mention because I was um, breaking that down a little bit by demographic groups, but I also think it's really important to mention that there are groups of people, regardless of the demographics, who are our base. And our base is not the hundred and something folks on this call. We're the advocates, we're the folks working in this field. The base are the people who are not connected to our work, but that who generally believe the things that often advocates believe in, but that they believe that housing is a human right. We should invest in it, that the government has a role to play in it. And then there are people that are the persuadables. And those are the people that are not our base. And they believe, yes, housing is a basic need. And they also believe that housing, if you are homeless, if experiencing homelessness or housing instability, it's because you made a bad choice. So they have these two ideas that are in conflict with each other. Our work, particularly as we look to grow uh, the base and bring the persuadables into more of a, of a base, then it means that our work is about how do we talk to that audience and how we talk to that audience is not going to be the same as how we talk to the base. Conversely, if we say things to them that don't gel, they're going to move over to the other side, to the opposition side. So they're that middle group of people that we can bring in to expand our base. But we also, if we're not talking to them the way that they need to hear it, we're going to end up pushing them onto the other side as well. Yeah, I mean, I think in very practical terms, right, it's, um, so again, like the day-to-day -day stuff, right, not all the social, we have, we're, as nonprofits, I think, trained to think, think of, like, communications as an afterthought, like, okay, we're going to do this programmatic thing or this policy thing, and the last thing we're going to, like, kick it over to communications to make it pretty, right, and it's like, do a social media post and make it go viral, right, as though social media hasn't changed and evolved and has different audiences, et cetera, right, like, Facebook is not Instagram. Instagram is not Instagram Reels. TikTok is a whole new thing that's like blowing up the world. Um, people came in droves back to next door during the pandemic. And there's a lot of, I think, blind spots, right, from some very practical um, points of view in terms of our communication strategy that we think we just need to own that, right? Like how something lives and operates on those different platforms will look differently, will succeed differently, right? In addition to all of the dimensions that Marisol just laid out about like, you know, racial differences, demographic differences based on generation and location, right? So specifically, like if we're trying to get people to feel really strong and aspirationally here in California, we would drive them toward those regional state identities more than we would drive them toward like, you know, we wouldn't start flying American flags everywhere, right? Like people, we know the data tells us that people feel more strongly about being citizens of the bear republic than they feel strongly about being citizens of the united states of america right so those are those are things that you can use like pieces of information that you can use as you start to plan it out but remember the pivot that we need to make is going from you know as marisol laid out at the beginning our campaigns oriented mindset of like these are our messages these are our frames these are our talking points you know this is our strategic communications plan for like a one and done we have to start thinking about a bigger, more involved, um, you know, integrated vision around narrative. 
And so the, the you know pop culture analogy I'll use in this instance is what's the difference between the Marvel franchise and the DC franchise, right? The Marvel Cinematic Unit in a Universe franchise is a great way of understanding narrative. They figured out how they're going to like tie together all these disparate movies and all these disparate heroes and TV and like series and shorts and all of these like hidden things at the end. And like, you know, DC is like, here's a Superman movie. Here's a Flash movie. And as they're starting to kind of try to like catch up on that side with what the Marvel Cinematic Universe is doing. But they're, I think, finally understanding that people need Google Maps, right? People need lots of different ways that they can go. Like everything else in our life is about three different ways, five different ways to get to a destination. But we tend to like box ourselves in very narrowly around our, you know, day-to-day -day nonprofit communications or even our annual work plans for communications, right? And a lot of that is dictated by the way that funders say, look, okay, well, you proposed that you're going to do this and now you got to deliver this because that's your deliverable, right? So it's, we have this push and pull with our funders. We have this push and pull with our executives. We have this push and pull with our partners about, we need to not lose sight um, you know, of the forest because we've said we're going to focus on this particular narrow set of trees, right? There's a world of difference between somebody who was on TikTok, who has grown up with three once in a lifetime disasters, you know, 9-11, the Great Recession, and then the pandemic versus, you know, those boomers that are still in the workforce um, who came in, you know, right at the end of the Korean War, right? There's worlds and worlds of difference there. So even within the same town in Orange County, even within the same, you know, sort of geographic physical space, even within the same organization, there's like incredibly divergent worldviews. But if we can figure out how we're weaving people back together, that's a really powerful place for us to be, right? It's defining that aspirational four um, that they can be all working toward getting toward. Um, that's like the really strength, the, the 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 core strength of the narrative work, really. It's not just saying the system is rigged and it's broken, right? I think it's easier to like point to those things as Marisol was saying. People have like a, a reflexive understanding of how it's not right that the system is rigged and broken. And then the next step is like, okay, we all we agree that it's broken, but now we got to move it toward it being, you know, the thing, the shining light on the hill that we want it to build. Thank you so much. It's uh, you know, listening to you both, this is such a nuanced uh, area and it's not a sort of formulaic, this is what you say, this is what you don't say. You know, there's so many different pieces that we need to take into account um, for a different situation. So if somebody's talking to their neighbor or a coworker, or they're making comments at a, at a city council meeting, or perhaps they're communicating to somebody who's a part of their faith community. And so with that in mind, this is a big question, um, but to really help uh, the attendees today have some practical tools, what are some principles that you would recommend that people keep in mind um, when approaching these kinds of communications and, and develop conversations? And so Anaya, I'll start with you. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it is just about, again, figuring out the ways that it can go right and figuring out the ways that it can go wrong with different audiences. I think it's trying to identify your blind spots, right? You know, Marisol, um, in, in the webinar chat, there was some reference to some of the work that you'll find on the Housing Narrative Lab. You know, her team just did this great test around a series of videos, right, and found you know, that, you know, uh, black audiences and white audiences were driven by different videos. And then you have uh, Latine, Latinx, Latino audiences and Asian audiences. And there was one set of videos that had like neutral um, as a reaction back from some of those Asian audiences, right? And Marisol and I were reflecting on like, if we get a neutral reaction on something, I think that means we have a blind spot, right? I think we, we, we don't really fully understand this population enough to really move them either in one direction or another. And so that means that we have learning to do there, right? So I think it's like really, you know, all cards on the table, um, understanding that stuff in, in your planning and execution processes and in your evaluation processes, right? That helps you dictate this work. Um, and as I said, you know, it's really hard to um, find the one slogan or the one graphic or the one campaign that everyone is going to agree on. And that's okay right? Because there are supposed to be tensions, there are supposed to be conflicts, right? Narrative, again, is supposed to hold cognitive dissonance. It is not supposed to be this, like, through line of uniformity where everybody is, like, you know, saying the same thing as sort of like the, 
you know, wrinkle in time world where like everyone lives in the suburban house and everyone bounces the ball at the same time and everyone speaks the same words. That's not what we're going for. And that's not how people work. That's not how anything works, right? So I think we need to disabuse ourselves of the illusion that that's the right way to do this work. Um, you know, one of the things that we've been really trying to do on our side is to do that defining of what is this big aspirational thing that we can all hold on to, that we can project ourselves into. And for us, it's Roadmap Home 2030, right? Roadmap Home 2030 is this is, is a set of 60 policies, five dozen policies that are state and federal policies that are meant to support, you know, work that's happening at the county, at the city, and at the continuum of care level to really solve these issues, right? It is supposed to solve homelessness. It is supposed to solve the affordable housing um, challenges that we're facing. It is supposed to, to protect people and solve the tenants' pr uh, protections, gentrification, and displacement challenges that we're having, right? But just because you have all of the solutions doesn't mean that you have the political will to effectuate them. And as I said earlier, I don't need for someone to understand, you know, the 57 policies that are laid out. I don't need them to be able to explain every single one of them. I need them to believe that there is a vision, that there is a plan, that there is a moonshot that we can gear ourselves toward. And again, that to me is not Pollyannish, right? That to me, again, is a, is a ref people want that, right? If people were content to be exactly where they are in life, you know, we wouldn't have as much risk taking as we see. There would be no new nonprofits that get founded. There would be no philanthropic ventures gained. There would be no people running for office. Like everyone would just kind of like accept that this is it. You know, we're done. We're just going to ride this out until the end. But not everyone has joined, um, you know, a community in the in the woods that has abandoned technology and removed themselves from the grid. Like whether we want to believe that we actually share a social compact anymore, we are we are by through our actions showing that we do. We still have an expectation. We have an expectation that when we go to Target, we're going to get offered a credit card. And if we accept it, we're going to get 10 percent off. Right. We have an expectation um that we're going to be able to buy a home for our family and keep you know some sort of legacy for our children we have a lot of expectations those expectations don't align with the realities don't align with the data right according to the data everyone should have given up and gone home a long time ago sometime in the 1980s but we never did that right there has always been a moment in which someone has been able to point people in the direction of you know what, we're actually going to go to the moon. And people respond to that not by saying, well, that's ridiculous, John F. Kennedy. We're not going to go to the moon. What do you know? You won by like 10 votes in Chicago, which were all suspect. They say, no, actually, yes, we're going to go to the moon. We're going to build the world's best research university system. We're going to build JPL and NASA. And we're going to create a, you know, a country and a, and a, and a population that is prepared to go to the moon and, and build off of that success. I think we are all yearning for that moment within this work of solving homelessness. And I think that we are prepared for folks to embrace that work, which is why we've introduced this Roadmap Home 2030, because we think that people can project themselves into something bigger than themselves and start gearing in that direction. I love that. I love that. I love that. And, you know, so much of what Unai we are talking about is how the work we are doing is both a science and an art right? So that the science is all about when you are communicating, know who your audience is, that's really key and know your goal. What is it that you want them to do? So audience and goal, that's science. That doesn't ever change. The essentials of things like putting people with lived experience, telling their stories in the center. There was a question in the chat about how do you talk to a councilman who says people experiencing homelessness should go to the desert. Uh, maybe tell them about how many of the people experiencing homelessness in Orange County are Californians, are probably, based on the data, are likely going to be from Orange County, or at the very least, they're going to be Californians. So really centering the experiences of people with lived experience, those are our neighbors, those are our moms and dads, those are seniors, people with disabilities, really shaping who we're talking about here. So I think there's a whole science, and you can see that in our message guidance document that the lab has has put together and right to some of Unai's point there's also the art right and the art is that language is flexible constantly that ideas are always shifting and moving Unai is the king of all things pop culture pop culture is always shifting and moving and how you use different pop culture references based on who you're talking to that's the art 
That's the flexibility. The tools are always changing, right? From Facebook to now TikTok to, you know, we used to talk in person and on the telephone and now we don't do that anymore. All of that is fluid. So the art is the piece that also is coming in. And so thinking about as you are thinking of the principles, recognizing that there is a science to it and you will see a lot of the, the pieces that are always the same around the essentials that guide how we communicate with people to shift a narrative. And then there's the art, which requires a lot of the flexibility. And we're using things like narrative research to then help us shift and move the art pieces around. I can't believe we only have three minutes left in our conversation. This has been so good and so deep. And I know we could keep talking about this. Um, but as we are wrapping up, I would love to ask you um, if you had the advice of a first step uh, for somebody to take. Um, and I'd love one of you to answer. If you work for an organization, what's the first step you can take? And if you're an individual, what's the first step that you could take? Um, around to be more thoughtful and mindful with our communication to help advance narrative change. And so Marisol, I'll come to you. If for an organization, what would your suggestion be for step one? Uh, I would say speak simply. Speak simply, speak directly, speak clearly. If that is a step one, maybe attached to that is know what the story is that you want to tell. What is the narrative that you're working toward? And then once you've decided on that, how are you going to say that clearly, concisely, and simply? Thank you. And I, I'll come to you for any individuals who are here. Yeah, so. no, absolutely. I think every individual is a powerful conduit for a bigger change, right? By, you know, we used to always say, well, I come from labor, and we used to always say, like, when you're starting a conversation with somebody, you should ask them, what's the problem? What's the solution? And why should I care? because it's going to get them to feel ownership over the rest of this conversation, right? So I think that's very important is that we are not, I'm not trying to sell you solving homelessness. You feel ownership over solving homelessness, you will work to solve homelessness. You will work in coalition, you will work in new ways. You will think about where you're starting the conversation, how you're conducting the conversation. You will follow the great research that's coming out of the Housing Narrative Lab. You will look at Roadmap Home 2030 as like this sort of like, big plan that proves we do have a green new deal for housing we do have a, a way of changing and revolutionizing the system and doing a moonshot right i think that those things are really essential um you know i we lost it in this conversation but there was this there's this thing that marisol always says we're often talking about something as simple as housing first and defending something as simple as housing first and marisol always says like if someone says to you housing first don't doesn't work you always ask them if you were in a drowning ship would you want a life jacket or not and if they say no then let's get cool then you're like you know that's an end of conversation but if they say yes i would like a life jacket and be like okay well then we can have this housing first conversation right because the, the challenge of the titanic as we have a submarine in the headlines in search of the titanic the challenge of the titanic was not that life jackets and lifeboats didn't work the challenge was that there was not enough of them for all the people that were aboard the Titanic, right? And that automatically puts you in a different conversation. And so again, like I am, you know, as I, I've always said, like Marisol is, you know, she's the headline act and I'm happy to be like, you know, sharing the stage with her as a guest artist today. And I thank all of you for join, for allowing, allowing us to join you um, today. Just to echo that, thank you so much to everybody who tuned in today. Thank you to those of you who sent us questions in advance that we were able to use to shape the agenda today. There's a poll that's popped up here. We would love for you to just take about 60 seconds, probably less than that, um, to respond to that poll. That's always helpful to us as we are planning for future community chats. Um, this will be up on our YouTube and our Facebook. So for anybody who wasn't able to make it today, or if you thought, oh, I, our communications person really needs to see this, this will be available up on YouTube and Facebook. So thank you so much, Unai and Marisol, for joining us for thank all you. of the insightful things you had to say today and to bring to us. I really, really appreciate it. I look forward to our ongoing conversations with you. Thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful rest of your day.